coming up on the weekly, an exclusive interview and gameplay session with Snipedown as he walks us through a 30 kill spree. Staying with Halo, we also have highlights from the MLG Live event this past weekend. Revenge. We've got a classic game of the week you won't believe. Also on this week's show, we premiere our new miniseries, Gaming 101, with a look at the world of StarCraft. All this and so much more starts now, only on MLG Weekly. Here on MLG Weekly, we like to give you exclusive interviews and gameplay from your favorite pros. Snipe Down Skyped into our studios this week to discuss all things Halo and give us his impressions on what's to come in Anaheim. What's up guys, it's Puckett and Shockwave coming at you from the MLG office and today we are watching some gameplay from Snipe Down who is joining us right now via Skype. Snipe Down, what are we watching here? Uh, I've been streaming recently with uh, Justin TV and my live gameplay and the first eight people that sent me messages uh, from my stream got invited to my party and we just ran random eights in the playlist and this is just an incredible game I played and I wanted to share it with everyone. Well it looks like a great time for three of them and a terrible time for the other four as you're heating up here with the sniper rifle. But first off before we jump into the gameplay itself, I have to ask you and congratulate you first of all on your performance in Columbus with your new Dynasty lineup featuring Heinz. You, get, you guys finished third place. You're the only team to take a game from Instinct. Were you expecting to, per to perform that well in Columbus? Uh, honestly, if you want to know the truth, we were expecting to perform better. I mean, we performed very well, don't get me wrong, but we wanted to perform to our best potential. We feel like we did not play up to that on Sunday. It was a very disappointing day. Um, I was very glad to take a game from Instinct. I didn't want to see them go undefeated. That's actually the second time I've been on the team that has stopped the undefeated tournament. Uh, I was on Instinct in San Diego 08 when Stray Ripon went. I uh, only lost one game that tournament. So I'm pretty good to be that guy. So you're pretty good at ruining records. Yeah. So there's your sharpshooter medal. You just got a running riot, so that's 16 kills in a row without dying. And you're not going to stop anytime soon, are you? No way. I'm, I'm on a hunt right now. Would you say this is the best game you've ever played in matchmaking? Oh, for sure. This is this is honestly one of the best games I think I've ever played, ever. Now, you've always been one of the best snipers in the league ever since you first joined up. Talk to me, what is the key to being a great sniper? I think the key to being a great sniper is honestly your map positioning and where you put yourself. Uh, if you have a sniper rifle, you're trying to be on the opposite end of the map as the other team and catch them off guard. So you cannot have the best game and still have the best positioning and be a great sniper, but uh, I think positioning with the sniper is a lot more important than accuracy. But right now, it looks like you're absolutely dominating and you have another sniper. What's going on here? I don't know. I think that's my first time no shields in quite a long time. I was not going to die right there. I needed one more sniper. Like you can see, the beam the bullet, uh, very rare metal to get, and you can see me do a little victory dance right there. Uh, I was pretty excited at this point, and you know, I'm thinking, well, why stop there? I'm doing this hot right now. I'm not about to die anytime soon. What does the Be The Bullet medal mean? I don't even know it. It means 15 snipes in a row, but it was 15 headshots in a row. So, it's pretty rare, it's a pretty rare medal. And uh, right here is, I just missed those three shots previously. And, you know, I just, I'm getting it back right now with that triple kill. Making up for it. Yeah, making up for it. Here's the overkill, I don't know why. He ran! Yeah, you didn't pull the trigger! I don't know, I don't know what can I say, but you know, I got, I got one shot left and you know, I gotta use that last shot for the invincible. It's the only right way to go out. One shot left in the sniper and you hit the invincible. Is that 30 in a row? That is 30 in a row. Is that your first ever invincible? That's my first ever invincible in the MLG playlist. Yes, especially against people who are actually pretty good. Snipe Down, thanks so much for sharing your gameplay with us. I know Shockwave and I can't wait to watch you and the rest of Dynasty in Anaheim. Guys, you can watch it live right here on MajorLeagueGaming.com July 29th through the 31st. To say that membership has its privileges is an understatement when it comes to what you get when you join the MLG family. Check out this quick video with the 411 on what's to come. On July 4th, the sparks were flying as the top players in StarCraft II, Halo Reach, Call of Duty Black Ops, and Quake faced off on MLG Live. 
Check out our highlights from the Hill Reach competition. What's up guys, Pucka here with your highlights from our show match between Status Quo and Dynasty. In game one, it was all Dynasty at the start of the game. Here we have Tzoxic taking fire, turns around, puts shots on Flamesword, and with no shields, jumps out to finish the kill. A little bit later, Snipedown got things heated up with the Rockets taking out three members of Status Quo on a seven kill spree, which led to a 3-0 flag cap lead for the Dynasty squad. Flamesword, the team captain from Status Quo, turned things on about five minutes in the game. Here he is stopping flag cap number four, killing Hines down low, turns his attention to snipe down, and while taking shots from the right, finishes the assassination, and then with no shield, takes out to Zoxic, stopping three straight players and getting the flag return. Dynasty ended up winning game one and carried that momentum into game number two. At the start of the game, it was all status quo until Tzoxic got the sniper rifle for Dynasty. Here he is picking up his first of two triple kills, taking down Assault top middle. A few seconds later, he pushes to the left side of the map, spots a naval, hits him with a body shot, and then cleans up Flamesword and Assault once again for back-to-back -back triples, giving Dynasty a five kill lead. A little bit later in the game, Snipedown continues to control the power weapons. There you saw him pick up the assist with the grenade launcher, and then out comes his DMR, taking down Assault, spotting two more players. Check out the angle here in the air, cleaning up the kill on a naval, and then stopping Flamesword bottom middle. That is three members of status quo, and then he spots the fourth. A naval tries to get away, but Snipedown catches him in midair, sprinting to the middle of the map, connecting with the incredible headshot, killing all four members. Just a few seconds later, Heinz turns it on with a stick for a 10 kill lead. Dynasty went on to win that game in game number two. But in game number three, status quo started showing some life. But once again, it was Dynasty off to the early start. There you saw Snipe down, out DMR, the respawner. A little bit later, his teammate Tizoxic connects on the no scope, taking down Assault as Dynasty gets off to an early three to one start. But a little bit later, Assault from status quo starts heating up. Here he is in the Dynasty base, picking up the double kill, putting shots on a second player, and then scoring flag cap number two. Later in the game, status quo was up four to three until this incredible flag play from Hines. Snipe down was taken out with the flag inches short. Hines rolls up seconds before the grenades blow up and tied it up, but in the end, status quo would win it five to four, which would make the series two to one in Dynasty's favor going into game number four. At the start of the game, Hines got off to a great start with the Rockets, picking up a double kill, and then later pushing into the status quo base after playing some great defense. Check him out, controlling both power weapons. Out comes the Sniper and the No Scopes, taking down Flamesword and Ace for the killing spree, and finishing off a six kill top middle. Dynasty would go on to get a two to one lead in the game until Flamesword started heating up with the Sniper. Check out this incredible shot here onto Zoxic, and midair, Flamesword connects with amazing reaction time, but the real story of the game was all Dynasty and all Hines. Here he is back with the Rockets late in the game, needing just one more flag. Hines cleared the way with the Rockets, pushing into the status quo base while all of his teammates got in position. And once they were, Hines took over the game, finishing off kills at the base. And Hines would go on to put in flag number three, winning the best of five for Dynasty, three to one. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation of MLG Live. Make sure to check us out on our next broadcast. Here at MLG Weekly, we give you the most in-depth insight into the world of competitive gaming. We want everyone to play, enjoy, and understand the games we cover. In our new series, Gaming 101, we give you the basics of the game, the key to success, and some simple tricks to help you improve your play. This week, we take you into the world of StarCraft II. StarCraft II is a titan of the video game world, boasting sales of nearly 3 million copies and has over 300,000 people playing online at any given time. There are multiple tournaments and LAN events going on every day where pro players can compete. StarCraft is an RTS game of economic management, unit control, and strategy. In StarCraft II, players compete as one of three different races, the Zerg, the Protoss, or the Terran. Each race comes with its own unique strengths and weaknesses, however the same race can be played quite differently depending on the playstyle of the competitor using it. Frequently, amateur players of StarCraft look up to the pros who play the same race. Players like Idra and Losira have a strong fan following of Zerg players because of how well they play Zerg. Players tend to root for pros who play their race in much the same way that big cities root for their local sports teams. Zerg units are very bug-like in nature and rely on sheer numbers to overtake opponents. Players using the Zerg try to reach max unit count as quickly as possible. In order to achieve this, Zerg players try to stay at least one base ahead of their opponents to create a strong economy. 
Additionally, Zerg buildings and units spread a goo called the Creep that increases their line of sight and unit speed. The Terrans most resemble the human race. Their greatest strengths are their unit diversity, defensive capabilities, and building mobility. Though Terran players are commonly known for cheesy tactics like quick tech paths or building structures close to enemy bases, they must play smart or be overrun by the Zerg's superior unit production capabilities or wiped out by the Protoss' superior unit compositions. The Protoss are a wise and intelligent alien species sworn to kill the Zerg. Protoss units are by far the most powerful in the game. However, the Protoss are not invincible. There are many instances where they simply don't have the forces to hold off early or well-timed attacks. This is because they rely on gas to construct almost all of their units, and those units take a long time to upgrade. Their greatest advantage is the ability to warp in units anywhere there's a pylon. This makes their surprise attacks very deadly. There are three aspects and terms players of every race and skill level should know. These are Macro, Micro, and APM. Macro is the ability to see to the little details in the game and react accordingly. This includes monitoring the actions of your opponent, managing your economy, watching the minimap, and controlling your own army. One of the best methods of improving this aspect of your playstyle is what StarCraft Community All-Star Day 9 has dubbed tapping. This is the constant rhythmic checking of your economy, unit positioning, and mini-map changes on the battlefield. While not as all-encompassing as Macro, Micro is still an important part of any good player's game. It involves the ability to manage your forces accurately during combat. Good Micro allows small forces to take larger forces down. There are several micromanagement techniques that all players should know. Kiting is hitting your opponent's melee forces with your ranged forces as you move away. This allows you to dish out damage and take relatively little yourself. Poking your opponent's base with flying units and leaving the moment counter forces come allows you to inflict major damage while keeping your forces safe. It's not an easy feat mastering micro, but it makes a huge difference in any engagement. APM stands for actions per minute. It's a measurement of how fast you click the buttons on your computer. This corresponds with your ability to multitask in game. Nearly every action, from telling a unit to move to creating a building, counts towards your current and average APM number. While a high APM is generally associated with how good a player is, some players do quite well with a low APM. To improve your APM, you should never stop doing things during a game. Another important skill is memorizing all of your hotkeys. This allows you to accomplish in-game tasks much faster. By doing these things, your APM will go up and give you an advantage over your opponent. There you have it, a complete breakdown of some of the basics of StarCraft II. We hope they help elevate your gameplay, understanding, and enjoyment of the world of competitive gaming. Here on the Weekly, we give the gaming community exclusive access to the new games in the test phase of development. The Uncharted 3 beta opened up June 28th for players with PlayStation Plus or a voucher from Infamous 2. For everyone else, it was up July 5th. Seeing how wildly successful the previous two iterations of the Uncharted series were, we got our hands on the beta to see what the fuss is all about. What's up everybody? This is Zach Mazada and I'm coming to you from the Major League Gaming Studios in New York City. I recently got my hands on the Uncharted 3 beta and I wanted to give you guys my first thoughts and impressions on the game. The customization in the game is broken down into two different categories. Competitive, which deals with your weapon traits, boosters, and kick medals. And your non-competitive, which deals with your appearance and taunts. There are five different matchmaking game types. Team Deathmatch, Free For All, Free Team Deathmatch, Hardcore, and Co-op Arena. Brand new to the Uncharted series is something called Kickbacks. The Kickback system incorporates the single player aspects of collecting treasure into the multiplayer. By collecting treasure, you can then use special abilities for your character. As you can see here, I've got a speed boost. The beta ships with two different maps, Chateau and Airstrip. Both are quite enjoyable, especially Airstrip's opening level in which players battle back and forth, jumping over moving cars to get to a supply plane and lock it down. With that said, both of these maps felt a little too big for free-for-all. There were times when I would wander the map and not see anybody for 20 seconds. I would say cut the map in half and change it from 1st of 15 to 1st of 25. The melee system was a bit frustrating in that it just became the first person to mash the square button twice. This would even lead to players trading lives. The shotgun and I had a love-hate relationship. As you can see from this clip, it took me three shots to take this guy down and I was pretty close to him. However, in the next clip you can see it was a one-hit kill. Whether it was lag or random spread, when the gun works, it's effective. The last improvement I would make is to make the grenade fuse a bit longer. It seemed too overpowered. If the grenade was anywhere within 5 feet of you, there was no chance of you surviving. All in all, I really enjoyed this beta. 
With some minor tweaks, Uncharted 3's multiplayer can be great by its November release. Major is a Terran player and member of Team Six Jax who's relatively new to the scene. He's coached by Artosis and has proven he can play with, and in many cases beat, some of the best StarCraft 2 has to offer. In this tip of the week, we check out three killer builds from this rising StarCraft Pro. In Game 2 from the 2011 Columbus event between Major and Tyler, Major uses a fast expansion build that transitions into a heavy bio army composition. Major opens the game by blocking his ramp with two supply depots and a lone barracks, denying Tyler's scout, leaving him in the dark. This is a key aspect to the build. Tyler doesn't know if Major's doing a fast expansion build or an all-in build like a cloak banshee rush. After successfully denying Tyler's scouting probe, Major throws down a command center and begins building a bunker to defend his natural. Constructing a bunker is key at this point since the only units a Terran player has to defend are Marines. Major maintains his economic lead over Tyler by throwing down a third base around the 10 minute mark. Major never lets up on his Marine and Marauder production. He also keeps up with his medevac count, which is key to surviving engagements with the Protoss army and your own stims. When Major sees Tyler's heavy Colossi army, he throws down a second starport, allowing higher Viking production and continued medevac support. Major's early second base secures his economic lead, allowing him to produce more units and maintain an economic advantage. Ultimately, Major wins the game by having the economic advantage and waiting for Tyler to strike at him rather than striking out himself. In build number two, Major goes for his trademark fast expand build, quickly getting a second command center up and running. This strategy works well against Protoss, allowing the Terran player to gain an early economic lead. As long as you hold off early pressure from your opponent, you will have a significant mid and late game advantage. Major scouts and controls one base starport void raid pressure and proceeds to only build marines which do well against early game Protoss units. If Major had gone with a Marauder or Reaper build, the game would have turned out much differently. By picking off multiple void rays and having decisive unit control, Major forces in control to GG. Here's a tip for the fast expand build. Never underestimate the marines and do your best to cut the void raid numbers down, preventing them from reaching a critical mass. Finally, in build number 3, Major gets a slight economic advantage early on with another fast expansion. He begins constructing a healthy number of marines and marauders, knowing Axelab loves to put 3 gate pressure on Terran players. Around the 8 minute mark, Major engages a push from Axelab, taking out a good number of Axis sentries, the key units in a Protoss ground army. With this move, Major is able to handle the pressure from two fronts. In Major's main, Axelab drops Zealots with the Warp Prism. He also simultaneously pushes on Major's natural with Stalkers and Sentries. This inflicts significant damage to Major's economy, killing his workers. Major is able to make up lost ground by grabbing the gold expansion and pulling multi-pronged drops and quick attacks. He denies Axelab's further expansion while also forcing him to stay in his base in order to defend against Major's drops. Major shows great skill microing his units, controlling multiple fronts at the same time, and knowing when to engage or retreat. This tactic allows him to come back from a significant disadvantage and take the win. The recent MLG event in Columbus gave the gaming community some of the most exciting play ever witnessed. In this week's countdown, it's Halo's turn to take center stage with the top 10 plays. Here we go, getting it started with the best player in the game. His name is Roy, and this kid is a monster. Here he is going up against Dynasty and Countdown CPF. Dynasty has his flag, but Roy moves in, cleans up the double, and turns around for the triple, returning the flag, saving the day for Instinct. Moving on now to number nine, we got Tizoxa going up against Instinct. Drops down, Pistola's right there, ignores him, cleans up the kill on Ogre 2, and turns around and gives Pistola the business. Check it out one more time. With no shield, Tizoxa connects with five perfect shots, embarrassing Pistola. At number eight, we got Ninja going up against Impact. Ninja lighting it up with the sniper rifle here, connects with the double kill, and he's not done yet. Out comes the DMR as he cleans up the triple, getting final boss all kinds of fired up. At number 7, Tizoxic is back for a second time in the top 10, this time with the sniper rifle. Picks up a headshot, stops the player bottom middle, and the quick shot up top for the trip. At number 6, we got my boy Swiftfield back on Sanctuary. Swiftfield doesn't need a sniper for this play. Check out the DMR action here. Gets help with the grenade for the triple, and then jumping over the rock, Peekaboo Sun cleans up the overkill extermination. At number five, we got APG, one of the best snipers in the league, showing off his reflexes, 
check out the quick scope one more time. Don't even look at me, Gabriel. Zooms in and shuts him down for the double. At number four, we got Nated for the first time. He's got the sniper rifle, connects with the grenade for the first kill. The headshot picks him up the double, and here comes Nated, clearing the way for the flag, pulls out the DMR, cleans up the third kill, and hits his object with the body shot, and connects with extermination. At number three, Nated back, it's the same life. He is still alive at the Dynasty base, and he's on a killing frenzy. 10 kills without dying, and make it 11 to Zazen. I don't think so. Peek it or Nated shoves him down with the no scope. Roy is back at number two, this time with the sniper rifle on Zealot. Starts it off with a body shot, cleaning up the kill on Tizoxic, working around. Finally spots Destin, taking fire, Roy hits the quick scope for the killing spree, that's five kills in a row, and he's not done. There's the no scope for the double, gets the call out, we got an injured snipe down, easy to shut him down with the headshot, sniper spree, and Roy can do it all, this time finishing strong with the DMR, seven kills in a row, that's Roy at number two. But now it's time for the play of the tournament. This one coming from Snipe Down and Dynasty. Down 13 kills against Status Quo in Game 5. Snipe Down and Hines turn it on for one of the best comebacks in MLG history. 47-46 as Destin is taken down in the middle. Tizoxic is going to pick up a headshot. You got two players in there. Oh! The headshot from Snipe Down for 48. The 49. Can he finish it? Oh! That does it for this top 10. Check out MidwayGaming.com to watch the pros play live from Anaheim July 29th to the 31st. We go back to Columbus once again for our game of the week. We find Optic Gaming and Force locked in battle for supremacy and of course bragging rights in game three of the Call of Duty Black Ops Championship Finals. Well, it's interesting watching Rambo push over here towards that forklift. He spots one completely stunned, but he will get taken out there by Impact. Bunch and the triple cap is about to go underway. J cap coming up here, Jumbo Pikachu wow. and Impact going down to his hand. This is amazing. Optic Gaming coming out huge again and again and again. 36 to 7, and just imagine how bad this trip cap is going to affect Force going into this first half. Oh, wow. I don't even know what to say. What do you say to a team that is continuously throwing you around the map like a ragdoll? They have no decision <laughs> in where they're going to be. They can't control the respawn. They can't even get out of their respawn at all. As looking at it right now, J-Cap is just watching over here, back over towards his side. There's a lot of action happening over towards that C domination side. It looks as if they got forced to spawn back over in that region as well. Uh, J-Cap now being the anchor, holding down A, making sure that he's got a nice path from A to B to counter any movement, and then turning around, he's got opposition in front of him. They're looking for some markers. Oh, Pick it up, one, one two, two, and three! Three, three in Picks place up. on A domination. This is J-Cap at his finest. I've never seen anything <laughs> like this. Unreal. J-Cap picking up the hat trick, picking up the three-piece, and he's just maintaining and holding down the A domination site. He doesn't need any support. He's got his FAMAS, and that's enough for him. J-Cap single-handedly held down the respawn wow. and floated Game <laughs> Force back over to C to get taken care of by Merc, who is doing a phenomenal job as well. This is the gameplay for the finals. This is everything on the wow. line. Anything you want to see you've never seen before. This is why we're doing the Pro Circuit here at wow. MLG. J-Cap picking up his fifth consecutive kill, probably even more so than that. Make that six, and finally, his reign of terror has ended. He goes 13-2 and two here in the beginning part of this game, and it's only three and a half minutes. 96 to seven is the lead here in favor of Optic Gaming. This is just unreal. Burke and J-Cap, how do you counter something you can't kill? <laughs> You've got no hope here whenever you're playing like a team that is on fire like they are right now. Rambo, backside, hit fire, takes down one and ends up taking out his teammate, switches to the Python, picks up another kill, moving back over here towards the C domination site. I don't care what you do, this is unstoppable, especially the way that all of Optic Gaming, it's not just one member, it's not just J-Cap, it's not just Merc, even Rambo and Big Timer are doing work here on Summit. 15 seconds left to play in this massacre, this complete domination, the uh, Wow, uh, as we look at it, uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to do a quick math because this has got to be the largest win in domination for Call of Duty Black Ops that we'll ever see. Not that what we've seen, what we'll ever see. That's it for this week's show. See you next time on The Weekly when we bring you the most in-depth coverage in the world of competitive gaming.